you keep your Bibles there at Luke 1, 26 to 38, where we will spend our time this morning. Luke 1, 26 to 38. It is good to be back in this building and to be together. Uh, and I'm feeling better. And um, I can taste again. And uh, I was sick for a couple, three days. And uh, I hear from some people I'm blessed to have been sick for two or three days and not longer and have had worse things. But uh, we're thankful to be together. Son RJ has moved here. We had some excitement yesterday. He was just the other side of Lafayette in Indiana. Uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. And uh, he had a guardrail there in the construction zone, totaled his car. And so we, uh, Amy and I, jumped in the car and drove to Louisiana last night, came back. Uh, we're thankful he's okay and that he's here. He's going to be living here. And we're thankful for that as well. Remember, when we found out that RJ was going to come into this world, we called our families. Tammy and I did. I have two brothers. One was in college. The other was married with his own wife. And so I called my married brother. And I spoke to my sister-in-law, who is also named Tammy. And as I'm talking to Tammy, I tell her that I'm going to be a dad. Just how excited I am. And she lays into me like I've never been laid into before. She begins telling me how disappointed she is. How she can't believe I have done that and how I'm going to get kicked out of that good Christian college I'm in. It dawned on me. My brother Kyle and I sound a whole lot alike on the phone. And she thought Kyle was calling from Freed Hardeman to tell her his girlfriend was pregnant. And she wasn't happy in the least. My birth announcement, RJ's birth announcement, didn't quite go as planned. Every parent in here has had that joy of calling others to say either the adoption agency has come through or my wife or I am expecting and we're going to be parents. You may have just picked up the phone like I did and called or you may have done something elaborate like I see on Facebook and YouTube. I'm too impatient to have done and thought of anything like that. Some of you might have done that. Mary, in this morning's text, gets quite an unusual birth announcement. Here she is, a young girl, virgin. Typically, they married between the ages of 12 and 15 in that day and age. The girls did. Boys married a little older. And so Mary is likely no more than 12, 15 years old at most. Here she is, minding her own business, enjoying life, fixing to be married to Joseph. She's betrothed to him. And lo and behold, Gabriel says, you're going to be a mama. You're going to conceive, bear a son, call his name Jesus. Mary wonders, now wait a minute, Gabriel, I'm a virgin. How is this going to be? Gabriel tells her a very simple, profound truth. One that we want to grasp this morning. And that is what Gabriel tells her there at the end of this passage. Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. 
as we go to Luke 1, 26 to 38, we learn the truth that nothing will be impossible with God. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, Elizabeth's pregnancy in and of itself demonstrates nothing will be impossible with God. You know, Elizabeth is an old woman. Zechariah, an old man. Elizabeth is barren. She cannot have children. But lo and behold, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel goes to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, a small, insignificant place, especially when you compare it to Jerusalem. It's nothing. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. To a virgin. Mary has never had sexual contact. She has not had a sexual relationship. She is a virgin. The NIV says she was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. She's betrothed to him. Binding as marriage can only be broken by divorce or death. She's basically already married. Betrothal would last for a year, be consummated on the wedding night in a sex act. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph, descendant of David. You were legally a descendant of your father. That's why Roman emperors would adopt sons even when in their older age and make them the heir. Legally, they would be descendant. And thus, Jesus, as Joseph's adopted son, would be legally a descendant of David. Now, you know he literally was through Mary, yet he would be legally through Joseph. The angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Those are unusual words for someone of high stature. That's not the way you would greet somebody who is rich, important, and famous in that day and age. Let alone for a teenage girl who was insignificant, who lived in a small, insignificant village. Mary was troubled, greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary was to name her son Jesus. Your parents know you go back and forth over what you're going to name the child, and you finally sell on the name, and Sometimes you change the name at the last minute. We'd sell on Will's name. It was going to be Bartley. Uh, sell on that for a long time. And just before he was born, we changed our minds. Mary's not given that option. 
She is to name her son Jesus. Yeshua. Meaning Yahweh is salvation. That's what the name means. You remember over Matthew 1, Joseph is told to name the boy Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The very name Jesus means salvation. The idea that God is coming to save his people. To name him Jesus. How will this be? Verse 34. Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Now, you remember, earlier in the chapter, Gabriel goes to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, you're going to be a daddy. Zechariah says, no. You, you know, I'm too old. Elizabeth's old. Ain't going to happen. No, you can't. No. no. He can't speak till named the boy John. He doubts. Mary says to Gabriel here, how can this be? I'm, I'm a virgin. It's not going to happen. I don't read any doubt here, especially as you read Gabriel's response to her. She doesn't doubt. It's not, oh no, it can't be. It's no. She's bewildered. This is outside the natural order of things. How is it going to be, Gabriel? I'm a virgin. How am I going to conceive and bear a son? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. The angel says, the power of the Most High God is going to come upon you. There is absolutely nothing sexual in that verse. In any way, shape, form, don't you hear me indicate that? In any way, that's blasphemous. But yet, the angel is saying how that male part of reproduction will be there. It's not going to be necessary, he says. Because God's power is going to come upon you. That's how you're going to conceive even though you're a virgin. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Come on, Come on you. Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In antiquity, Son of whatever meant you were that thing. You know, Son of a man, He's a man, right? Son of God is God. Doesn't mean Son as you and I think of Son. It means God. Son of God is God. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, held the incarnate deity. I love that line. One of my favorite lines in all our hymns. The incarnate deity. Be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, I know some translations say cousin. You may have heard cousin your whole life. Maybe, maybe not. Now, I know they're not Southerners and they wouldn't have claimed, you know, so-and-so of my hairdresser's great-nephew three times removed like we might. But we don't know. It's some sort of relative. She knew Elizabeth. Knew she was old. Knew she was barren. Didn't know she's expecting until Gabriel tells her. She who was said and able to conceive is in her sixth month. Verse 37. For no word from God will ever fail. That's one place the NIV translates literally. You know, it doesn't typically do that. 
It's unfortunate it does literally there. Because that phrase, that sentence, no word from God will ever fail, was a Hebrew idiom. You know, you're driving me up a wall, you don't mean literally. No word from God will ever fail was an idiom that meant that with nothing, that with God, nothing will be impossible. That's, that's, that's what it meant. When you meant to say nothing will be impossible with God, you said no word from God will ever fail. That's what it means. Now, I know that some people take this verse out of context and talk about getting a million dollars or winning basketball games. It's sure not helping Kentucky this year, I tell you that. Oh. In context, brothers and sisters, in context, nothing will be impossible if God applies to two things and two things only. The birth of John the Baptizer and the birth of Jesus the Christ. In context, that's what it means. That's all it means. The ga angel Gabriel means, look, the fact that Elizabeth was old, barren, she's still going to have a baby because nothing will be impossible with God. The fact that you're a virgin, you've never had a sexual relationship, doesn't matter. You're still going to have a baby because nothing will be impossible with God. God can overcome those obstacles. Because why? Because he needed to save man. Think about it. Why did God go through all this trouble Use all these extraordinary means to bring John the Baptizer and Jesus into the world. John was Jesus' forerunner, Jesus our Savior. Why? Answer simple to save you from your sin. The name Jesus, God, Yahweh, saved. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's his whole purpose. To be lost is horrible. When you were lost, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners, the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in this world. Without hope. During this COVID crisis, suicides have skyrocketed. It seems to me that the cure is worse than the disease, to be honest. And as people have been shut up, away from everybody they have come depressed without hope. I can't imagine anything worse than being without hope. And when we're lost in sin, we are without hope. And it's to keep us from being without hope that God sent His Son to this world to extraordinary circumstances. Nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. Speaking of the birth of John the Baptizer, the birth of Jesus the Christ, how should we live because nothing will be impossible with God? How should we live? Because nothing will be impossible with God. Let's keep that idea in context. 
Remember, it applies only very narrowly. The birth of John, the birth of Jesus. What if we applied those words the same way the person who first heard them applied them? Novel idea, isn't it? Take what Mary did as the way we live when we hear these words. Mary heard that Elizabeth is going to have a baby in her old age. She heard that she, a virgin, was going to conceive. What does she do? She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. What if that was our response? What if because nothing will be impossible with God? We get on our knees. And we say, I am the servant of the Lord. May your word to me be fulfilled. Put yourself in Mary's shoes for a moment. Her sandals, whatever she wore. Put yourself there. Can you imagine... The stare she got in Nazareth as an unwed mother back then. Oh, you and I know she did nothing immoral. We know that. But remember, her husband didn't know it. He's going to divorce her. Put her away. Why? Because she's committed fornication and he is thinking... Remember, it took the angel of God to say, no, 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 that's not what's happened. She's a virgin. This is God's plan. And then he responded appropriately. But he didn't know. Can you imagine what everybody else in town thought? The look she got in the synagogue. You remember when Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple. Simeon comes and he lifts him in his arms and talks about how Jesus is the redemption of Israel, the one for whom they have been looking. And he looks at Mary and she says, a sword will pierce your heart too. Looks, I, I know many people who have lost children. And I, 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 I can't imagine what But can you imagine sitting at the feet of the cross, seeing your son naked, crown of thorns on his head, the blood running down, his back just split open. Blood running down. The sun going dark. His cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To be suspended between heaven and earth, your son, because he's done nothing wrong, but he's bearing the sins of all mankind. Can you imagine? The sword that pierced Mary's heart. And yet, when the angel comes and says, Mary, you're going to have a child, although you're a virgin, what she say? Not no. Not oh, just go find somebody else. I am the servant of the Lord. That's what she says. This is God's plan for me. Fine. I am the Lord's servant. Whatever He says, that's what we will do. Because I'm the Lord's servant. We must be those who commit ourselves 
a servant of the Lord. Will you do that today? What if you, you went home, you went to your God in prayer, and you said the very words Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. May your word to me be fulfilled. You're not going to have a baby, although you're a virgin. But you can commit to following the will of God and doing His work. Doing His will. We must submit ourselves to God. Romans 6, 13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather... Offer yourselves to God. Is that not exactly what Mary does? Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. I am the servant of the Lord. James 4.7 Submit yourselves then to God. I am the servant of the Lord. With God, nothing will be impossible. Mary who conceived as a virgin. Elizabeth had conceived in her old age and although she was barren. Nothing is impossible for God. And Mary says, okay, because God can cause an old woman who is barren to conceive, because He can make a virgin, me, conceive. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Use me as you will. Have your way with me, O God. I will forever be your servant. How can you offer yourself as a servant to God? How can you offer yourself as a servant to God? Yeah, you, you, you can pray Mary's prayer, and let me urge you to do that. Seriously, to go to God in prayer and say, I am the servant of the Lord. It's not just lip service. It has to be service. How can you serve in your neighborhood? What neighbor might need some groceries? What neighbor might need some toys for the kid Friday morning? What neighbor might need a yard mowed when the weather's different? How can you serve at home? How can you serve in a Christ-like manner at home even when you don't feel like it? How can you serve in this congregation? How can you serve under the leadership of the elders? How can you teach Bible class? Prepare communion. Guys lead prayers. Sisters help young girls. How can you serve the Lord? How can you serve at school, at work, at the gym, wherever you are? How can you be the servant of the Lord. You know Mary signed up for a very difficult task. Can you imagine raising that boy? She loses him when they go to Jerusalem. You know she doesn't really, but anyway, she does. 
She thinks she does. Can you imagine the terror I've lost the Son of God? I mean, seriously. Can you imagine what it was like to teach him? He grew in stature, nurture, faith with God and man. She thought he was crazy in Mark. You know, he is teaching people. The Greek says his household, Mary included, went up to get him because he was crazy. Things he was saying. And then to watch him die. See him raised. He gathered there with 120 after the resurrection. She was a servant of the Lord. God sent His Son into this world to save this world, but brothers and sisters, without Mary, you and I would go to hell. Think about it. It's because Mary said to Gabriel, I am the servant of the Lord. Do with me as you will. You and I can go to heaven. Who is it that might go to heaven because of you? Because you offer yourself as God's servant. Because you say to God, use me as you need. Are you this morning the servant of the Lord? You need to come to Jesus for the first time. To humbly submit yourself to his lordship as Mary died. Be baptized for the mission of your sins, raised to be a servant of God. Do you need to come home? One who has wondered and recommit yourself to the servant of the Lord. You need to come this morning. Won't you come right now as we stand and sing?